today to worship. I want you to turn on your tablets, your phones, and uh, uh, your Bibles uh, to first, Second Peter chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. I'm going to minister to you today on the third part of the Adding to Your Faith series, and I've entitled this message today, Marshmallow Christians. Marshmallow Christians. How many of you love marshmallows? Anybody like marshmallows? We got a few marshmallow folks in here. So hopefully it'll become apparent why we're doing this, but we're, we're trying to highlight what Peter told to us to add to our faith to make us strong. How many of you want to be strong in this last day? Then you have to add or supplement your faith. You can't just say, okay, I'm saved, I'm a Christian, and I'm okay. There, there is a part of that that after we get saved that we have to work to build ourselves up in the kingdom of God. And so Peter addresses this, and the text is read from the Christian Standard Bible. It says, for this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with goodness, goodness with knowledge, which we dealt with last week, and knowledge with self-control. Self-control with endurance and endurance with godliness. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 16 through 17 from the Passion Translation says this. Be careful that no one among you lives in immorality, becoming careless about God's blessings, like Esau who traded away his rights as the firstborn for a simple meal. And we know that later on, when he wanted to inherit his father's blessings, he was turned away even though he begged for it with bitter tears, for it was too late then to repent. So I want to show you a video here in just a second because I want to set this up right quick. Today's message is about self-control and having self-discipline in our lives. Many, many years ago, uh, many of you may have heard of the marshmallow man, Walter Michel. He is an Ivy League professor known for his experiments in self-control. And nearly 50 years ago, he created a test to see how various five-year-olds would respond to being left alone with a marshmallow for 15 minutes with the instructions not to eat it. And with the promise that if they didn't, they would be given two marshmallows. Now this video I'm about to show you is not the original test, but it's someone else's recreation of what he did over 50 years ago. So for a moment, and for self-control purposes, take a look at this video. Sit in that chair. All right, here's the deal. Marshmallow, for you. You can either wait, and I'll give you another one if you wait, or you can eat it now. When I come back, I'll give you two, another one, so then you'll have two. But stay in here and stay in the chair till I come back, okay? okay. All right. So it's up to you. You can have it now or you can wait. Okay? I'll be back. Stay in the chair, okay? 
Okay. All right, so I'm gonna leave and then I'll come back, okay? So you can either eat it right now or you can wait. Either way, okay? Okay. <laughs> How'd you do? Did you do good? You did? Yeah. You wanted to eat it, didn't you? Yeah. So did I tell you to give you another one? Okay, now you can have both. You need them. <laughs> well, you can obviously see that that took a lot of self-control just to have that marshmallow. Now, if they put a peanut butter cup in front of me, I wouldn't last, I'm telling you right now. I would devour it. But self-control, we see it. I'm a little loud, it seems like, Yvette, from up here. I need to tone down on my outward check one two so uh self-control is obviously a thing that children not only have to deal with but us adults have to deal with in our life also when i worked for johnson and johnson corporation for many years we had a golf league that played weekly during the golf season and i played on that team for several years but i remember one day at the beginning of the season when a certain chinese man that i worked with saw me getting ready to play and he came over to me and he says jeff he says i didn't know that preachers were allowed to play golf i replied to him i said well why is that he said because you have to cuss and i thought oh well you have to cuss while you play this huh <laughs> but that was his that was his thing if you play golf you're going to cuss now i tell you i played golf and felt like cussing a lot i'm telling you when i was playing but i've learned just to laugh hallelujah and have a good time but here is the point. The truth is, you don't have to cuss or gossip or lie, cheat, steal, smoke, chew, or drink. You don't have to do those things in life. A lot of this is all about having self-discipline or having self-control. I was raised up in my life and my family with horses that's all we ever had to ride was horses and I rode them all my life love horses but a horse has little value to its owner without a bridle if you don't bridle that horse so that his presence there on your farm and in your pasture he really has no more value than just to eat all he wants to eat and to do whatever he wants to do but if you put a bridle in that horse's mouth, which represents self-control and discipline, you turn that horse and make him do what you want to do. And so is self-discipline and self-control in our life. So anytime that we are having a discussion with ourselves or another person about self-control, the discussion will always be centered around two subjects. The first one is, the presence of something within us that needs to be bridled. So when you're talking about self-control, you're saying to yourself, I have something inside me truly that needs bridling in my life. And I can tell you this, until you and I get fully free from the sin nature that we were born into, we will always be needing to control our wants, our passions, and our desires. Can somebody say amen? So that the first discussion that comes up is there's something that needs controlling. The second discussion about self-control is the need of drawing on some source of power or strength to restrain it. 
to keep it in check and to keep it in balance. And as a Christian church here, we understand, believe, and know fully that that restraining power is none less than the power of the Holy Spirit. He's able to help us to move through all the temptations, the trials, the lurements that will come our way and keep ourselves on the path so that we can remain self-disciplined in the Lord. You see, the definition of self-control is this. It is the act of denying yourself. In America, that's not a very popular ideology. In fact, we go to the excesses of seeing how much that we can indulge ourselves. But true self-control is denying yourself. That's not a popular subject even in churches today in life, to deny yourself. It means controlling your impulses or controlling your own behavior. So when you're talking about having self-control, add to your knowledge self-control so that you can be disciplined in life. How often have you told your children something like this when you were dealing with them pointing to their friends? They, you would say, I don't care what someone else did. You are responsible for your own behavior. In other words, you were pointing them to the fact that this is about your self-control and your self-discipline. It doesn't matter if they want to go wonky and do whatever they want to do in life. We are not going to do that. As Joshua famously said in the word, he said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. In other words, we're going to be self-disciplined and control in that area. In, in our subtext today from Hebrews, we see the story of Esau, who greatly lacked the spirit of self-control. Esau's predicament and the solution to his problem as presented to him by his brother Jacob. Now, I want you, you, you know that story, I think most of you do. This trade that Jacob suggested for the remedy of Esau's situation, it was not a trade for Jacob's stew for a prize goat or a prize bull in those days or even for a prize piece of land. Jacob told his brother Esau who had just come in from hunting and felt like he was famished. He said, if you want my stew bad enough, it will be at the price of your birthright. It will be the price of your birthright. Now some of you today may say, well, pastor, I don't even know what a birthright is. What, what in the world are they talking about? Well, you have to know in the Bible, in the Old Testament, this was a very valued thing in life. So the birthright was the right of the firstborn son to all his father's possessions or a double portion if there were several sons. And his authority to become the leader of his family. This was a big deal. He was trading away something. And you see, Esau's self-control issues highlights the fact that what needs to be controlled in our life is not something that is always evil or bad. There was nothing evil about the stew. There was nothing evil or bad about the birthright. So sometimes we're not talking about something evil that's pulled us, but sometimes it's something good. His hunger and desire for his brother Jacob's stew is not bad. But what he is willing to do to obtain it, that is not good and needs to be restrained. This is so important for us to understand to get ourselves as a soldier of Christ that is disciplined to stand and fight the fight of good faith in our very life. You see, our text from Hebrews 12, 17 reminds us that there will always be a later on time of regret. For that text I read to you, the subtext in Hebrews says, later on, when Esau had time to think about it, he thought, boy, I sure messed up, didn't I? So he tried to go back and get his birthright back, but the Bible says he could not because he sold it. Though he sought it with repentance and with tears, he could not reclaim it. Church, let me tell you something. There will always be a later on time of reflection. 
And that later on can either be bitter and sour or it can be joyous and good. And I can tell you that if you will be self-controlled and self-disciplined and listen to the Holy Spirit as he tries to guide and mark your way, you're going to have more happy days than you are sad days. But if you don't, if you follow your whims and your desires and everything that you want, try to grab everything, get everything in life, you are going to live a sad, miserable life. Esau, like that little red-headed girl in the video, she just gobbled up them marshmallows. She didn't even, I mean, the lady couldn't even finish talking and she'd had half of it ate. And that's the way a lot of us are. She did, and, and that's what Esau did. He just tore in to that pottage to satisfy his hunger while not fully considering the future fallout or consequences or the lack of self-control. That little red-headed girl couldn't care less that there was one more. All she knew is there was one before her, and it says, eat me, hallelujah, and I'm going to eat it before it gets away. Amen? But if she could have held off, you see, as an interesting side note to Mr. Michelle, the original uh, one who created this experiment, he has continued to keep tabs on his original kids that he did that famous marshmallow experiment on. And they are now past 50 years of age. He has discovered that the preschoolers who waited the longest in his test for the marshmallow went on to have higher SAT scores than the ones who couldn't wait. In later years, they were thinner, earned more advanced degrees, used less cocaine, and coped better with stress. This is his follow-up on those kids. Now, now, hold on. Please understand, this experiment was not fully conclusive. So if your kid would have been one that ate that marshmallow before the lady got out the door, they still okay, amen? It don't mean you got to go throw them out because they ate the marshmallow. I would have ate the marshmallow. I think I turned out okay. Not the best, but okay. So, you know, so, so don't worry about that. They still have hope. However, there is solid science behind what he did that as the kids who were able to use self-control and waited so they could have more and they did in life and it's such a valuable lesson to teach today about self-control in our lives Jesus made it clear that a Christian could not follow him successfully without implementing self-control and self-denial on a daily basis in Matthew 16 and 24, then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him what? Deny himself. That means using self-discipline and self-control, you are to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me, which is Christ Jesus. You see, the word deny in the Greek means to abstain or to refuse to recognize the desires of your own will or your own self-will. How many of you know the scriptures make it plain that you are no longer your own? Do you believe that? He said you have been bought with a what? And therefore you're to glorify God in your body and your spirit which belongs to him. You see, this is what we need to know. So the word deny, let him deny himself, pick up his cross, means to abstain or to refuse to recognize the desires of your own self-will. You see, in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus made it plain whose will must be preeminent in life. He said to his heavenly Father, not my will be done, but yours in heaven be done. And when Jesus taught us how to pray, when the disciples asked, he says, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Self-control and self-discipline is about moving ourselves to do the will of God. That's why the church is suffering and in part of the shape that it's in today is because people have not constrained or restrained themselves and they go after the world and everything that it offers and what happens is their love and their fervency for God cools off and they begin to grab and to receive and to become weighted down with sins and weights that they need to shake off and move out of the way because when we leave this earth, everything we see is going to dissolve and burn up. 
You've never seen, as they say before famously, you've never seen a hearse pulling a U-Haul. Amen. They ain't nobody taking anything with you that you got here. So the best thing to do today is to use discipline, self-control, deny yourself, listen to God, let him order all of your steps, and you will go in the right direction. Amen. You see, the Christian life is not easy. I think we have made a mistake when the pulpits of our churches telling everybody to come to Jesus, receive him as your Lord and your Savior, and everything will be okay. No, it won't. It will be with your personal spirit and your peace and your security in God. But you're still going to face temptations and trials and heartbreak and frustration in life. And if we don't have this tool in our spirit called self-control, we simply will not make it the way that God wants it. So we might as well go ahead and fess up that the Christian life is not easy. And if it was, everybody would be doing it. And everybody's trying a brand of it today that is easy. That's why we're seeing so many fake Christians fill the churches today. But I'm here to tell you, when God pulls out the fire of the tribulation, the test that's coming, he will separate from those, from the church, those who are just proclaiming and professing but are not real to the call and the cause of Christ. It's going to make a difference. So the Christian life is not an easy life. We cannot, as theologian Thomas Carlyle said, slackly wander into the kingdom of God. He went on to say, we carry with us a body prone to much that is evil, to sloth and pleasure, to spiritual idleness, to lust and envy. Yes, we do. We carry those things because we were born into a flesh that Adam and Eve corrupted by giving that authority over to the devil that the second Adam came and bought back for us, but we still have to initiate his power and his grace to live victorious. Amen? But we still live in this house. So we cannot with sloth wander into the kingdom of God. We must fight the good fight of faith. We must stay vigilant in life. Peter says a roaring lion is out there seeking whom he may devour and he's going to get those people who lack self-control and discipline. Amen? The soldier in the army who lacks self-discipline and self-control is going to not find his way easy and is going to get himself killed because he's not following the self-control and discipline teaching that he's been trained by. If a man of the Apostle Paul standing understood he was in a daily fight with his fleshly desires and sought God's help with self-control, then what does that say to us? Anybody here put yourself above the Apostle Paul? I sure wouldn't. Here, this man that wrote, what, two-thirds or whatever it is of the New Testament, this man that had visitations of God, this man that knew how to take Stripes on his back, shipwreck after shipwreck, enemies fighting him. He even killed him at one point that God had to raise him back to life. And what did he say in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27? He says, but I train like a champion athlete. I subdue my body. How I like that. I subdue my body and get it under my control. So that after preaching the good news to others, I myself won't be disqualified. Now let me just say something here. This is not about you mastering your emotions. This is not about you going to the, to the bookstore and finding you a self-help Christian book to show you how to get under control. You are not going to win at this situation in life unless Jesus and the Holy Ghost is the one who is doing the controlling in your life. Amen? We got people out there, they say, well, I did this, and I did that, I brought this. Well, if that was something you can do, then you probably had the ability to do that. But when we're talking about things that will derail our faith, we're not talking about a situation that we can boast and brag about. It is the Holy Spirit that gives us the power, and only the Holy Spirit can give you the power to overcome the flesh like it needs to be. I want you to understand that. In life, and I think most of you do. You see, the phrase literally, if you go look this up in the Greek, this phrase, subdue my body, is a metaphor 
when the Apostle Paul was speaking and saying, I beat my body till it's black and blue. I beat my body. Now, there were monks way back in several centuries that tried this. We see that um, um, many people, I, I was trying to think of the guy nailed the 90 Thesis on the door of Wittenberg, and he tried the same thing with chains in his life, Luther in life, until he came to realize that the just shall live by their faith. They have to live by discipline in the Lord, you know, but many have tried to, to beat this body till it's black and blue, and though the, it metaphorically means that, it means that you have to have that same intensity and that same desire to control your spirit, man, through the Holy Spirit so that it does, like a bridle in the horse's mouth, the rudder on the great ship, that when the master turns it, that that vessel goes the way God wants it to go. Amen? This is so important to understand. In Romans chapter 8, verses 12 through 13, Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. Amen? You don't have no obligation to do that. For if you live by its dictates, you will die. But if through the power of the Spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. So it's by the Spirit you've got to crucify and put to death those things that will pull you away from the love of God, that will pull you away from your worship of God, that will pull you away from your walk with God in life but if you live by the dictates of your flesh telling you to go here and do this and do that you can have this and you can have that you can have it all and a little bit more i'm telling you he says you will die but if you learn to get it under control with allowing the holy spirit to do it you will live paul said again in first corinthians 15 31 the amplified version he says i assure you by the pride which i have in you in your fellowship and union with Christ Jesus our Lord, that I die daily. I face death every day, and I die to self. Folks, that could be no more true in our lives today, and especially right now. We've got to get up every day with a fresh assault on this world that tries to come against us and say, I die daily today. I die to this world. I die to what it wants me to say. I die to what it wants me to do. I die to what it wants me to think. I die to those things that Christ may be preeminent in me. And when I walk through this world today, because I've died to them, I'm living to Christ, hallelujah, and I can follow a new plan and a new order that will lead me to a path of righteousness and life. Amen? Praise God. Now, this may make us feel uncomfortable, but self-control is not about achieving a mountaintop victory as much as it is a daily fight to subdue our flesh as we make our climb up the mountain till we finally reach home. You're not going to be coming here one day and say, hey, pastor, I got self-control under control. Hallelujah. Praise God. I no longer have any problems out there today. Well, I, the only way that could be true if you told me that you locked yourself in a cell block and decided to stay there the rest of your life, and then I guarantee you, you're going to have some problems with your thinking. Amen? So it's not a mountaintop achievement. It's a daily climb up that mountain, deciding to die Every hour of the 24 that we're up and awake and believe in God eventually to get us home on the top of the mountain. Amen? The word discipline, because self-control and discipline are basically the same word. But the word discipline has a twofold meaning. The first meaning of discipline means to punish. I mean, if you say I'm going to discipline a child, it means I'm going to spank them. Of course, you don't really do that anymore today because they'll get you in trouble for doing that. But... Behind closed doors, it's okay. Amen? Whatever you got to do, you know. But it means to punish. If this, Discipline means to punish. If this is the way we view the outcome of enacting needed self-control, then our spiritual walk will have little joy and much misery. If you see it as just punishment, 
Well, God's punishing me. I can't do this and I can't do that. If you would stop focusing on what you can't do and see what you can do in Christ, that you can do all things as he orders your steps, I'm here to tell you, you'd lose that old bad mouth experience. Amen? But discipline means to punish. And a lot of Christians, they see, well, God's punishing me. God don't like me, or God don't want me to do this. And God, You know, when I was growing up in the church, in the congregational church, we actually had a book called The Discipline. And The Discipline told you what you could and could not do. You couldn't go to the movies. You couldn't swim with the opposite sex. You couldn't do this, and you couldn't do that. It was a discipline, and it, it absolutely was that. It felt like punishment. And I guarantee if you stepped out of it, you'd get it too. Amen. Punishment's coming. Hallelujah. That good old spiritual punishment for breaking the laws. But listen, our self-discipline should not be to seem like punishment. The second thing that the, the word discipline means, it means training that corrects, molds, or perfects the mental faculties or moral character. That's what discipline ought to be. It trains us. It sharpens us. It causes us to become what God. And if we have to punish our flesh, if we have to punish things in our life, so be it. We die daily because there's something greater ready to come out of us that if we get this small stuff out of the way, then God can do some big things in us. Am I preaching okay? Some of you look like I am. Some of you, I kind of can't detect yet on that now. Amen. So maybe if it's over, I'll get some of you back over. Discipline. Discipline, discipline. Proverbs 25 and verse 28. A person without self-control is like a city with broken down walls. I want you to hear this. In the Bible times especially, strong, thick, fortified walls were the source of a city's safety and security in the Bible times. But if we are undisciplined, prone to indulge our appetites, doing what we feel like doing, exercising little self-control, then Satan doesn't even have to fire a shot. All he has to do is stroll into our lives and do whatever he wishes, like the walls of Jericho that fell down flat, then their enemies rushed in and took over. A city, with a person without self-control is like a city with broken down walls. Now listen, I try to stay as least political as I can, but sometimes I can't. Our nation's moral and political walls are in disarray today, which has left our nation open and vulnerable to destruction. The southern border of our nation especially is a symbol, it's a symbol concerning the spiritual values and the tenacity of our nation. If we're allowed our physical borders to be open, what does that even say about our spiritual borders? Because sometimes what you see on the national political level is being mirrored even in God's church. Sad to say, but it's true. Why I am for legal immigration, the resistance to our former president's project in constructing a wall to protect our people has now fallen into the people's hands who lack the morals and the fortitude of the people who founded this great land, which has now put our citizens in danger to drugs and all types of crime. When the cities, when a nation's and I'm looking at this from a symbolic standpoint of seeing what was started, trying to rebuild our fortification, trying to rebuild our protection, and now someone has rushed in and tore that away, and what have we seen? Nothing but evil take off as never before. And I'm not blaming all of our problems on the southern border. I'm just telling you that a person who is without self-control is like a city whose walls have been torn down. A nation who has no defense. Now, I'm not painting all who come here with the same brush, but when there are no walls to protect its people, we fall victim to those who desire to hurt us. And when we don't protect our spiritual lives in the church with discipline and self-control, then we are subject to opening ourselves to doing us harm. Listen to me, church. While I'm at it, I might as well just stir up a little more trouble. You know, if we got elections coming up, but if, if we, and, and I'm speaking to people across uh, the platform here live today, but if we can vote 
to keep a party in power that upholds unlimited abortion, soft on crime, tough on police, and a party that can't spend enough money, then somebody is being influenced by demonic spirits. Now, I'm just going to, I'm just going to put, they, 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 they may erase that or whatever, but I'm here to tell you, we've got to show self-discipline in our lives. That means rejecting what seems to be the norm, rejecting what seems to be the way of people and the way of man. And we need to get back on our knees, ask God to forgive us, ask God to humble us down, and to ask him to restore and to heal our land and to cause those proverbial walls of strength to go back up again because Thessalonians tells us that only he who now restrains will restrain until he's taken out of the way. Who's he talking about? The Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is our wall around this nation. And if we will worship him again and praise God and glorify his name, those walls will go back up again. Oh, hallelujah. They will go back up again. We've got to know this in life today. Again, I quoted this a while ago, but 1 Peter 5, 8 through 9. Be sober-minded. Be alert. Your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion, looking for anyone he can devour. Verse 9, the first part, resist him. Firm in the faith. That's what we must do. You can't resist somebody that you're in league with. You can't resist somebody that you're going along with. Jesus said in Matthew and in the Gospels, he says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. But when you take the yoke of the world upon you, you can't resist because they're taking you the way they want you to go because you've given your desires and your longings and you put down your discipline and self-control to go after the world and therefore you are lion's fodder. You are stake for them. You're stake. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we get a view of the battle that modern Christianity is facing due to our unrestrained and undisciplined way of life. In 1 Corinthians 6 and 12, I want you to hear this. This is what Paul's dealing with. You say, I am allowed to do anything. This is what Paul's having to deal with, these Corinthians. But not everything is good for you. And even though I'm allowed to do anything, I must not become a slave to anything. So we got a church world running around. I can do what I want to, Pastor. I'm free. God's grace has made me free. Well, you've just adopted a real greasy grace that's going to try to slide you in through some little small crack in the kingdom of God. I'm going to tell you something. You can't do whatever you want to do. You may be free to do a lot of things, but he said everything that you could do, you need to restrain yourself from some of them because it's not a good thing to go ahead. Amen? Just because something in our society is lawful does not make it permissible for us to engage in this activity. Abortion is legal, but it's also murder in God's sight. Amen? Prostitution, did you know that there are several counties in the, in the state of Nevada that it's okay to have prostitution? Well, I don't make it legal. I mean, I don't make it right just because it's legal. We have California and many other states that have, have legalized marijuana. That doesn't mean you need to go out and find you a big joint and smoke it. Amen? I mean, we have to show discipline and self control in our life. So you cannot do everything you want to do and be successful and be victorious in Christ. The crux of the matter for many Christians is that I can do whatever I wish because who the Son sets free has made me free indeed. Because the Son has set you free, he's opened your eyes to see that there's even some things you ought not to do that are labeled good. God's grace does not give us the right to say and do whatever pleases us because we have the freedom to do so. Just because it's true and just because you know it to be true don't mean that you ought to open your mouth and say it. Sometimes you just need to ask God for a better time in a different way. Am I preaching okay? You don't have the right to cuss somebody out just because they said something derogatory to you. I'm just going to cuss that person out. They cussed me out. Bless the Lord. I'll give them a piece of my mind. Yeah, they'll get it all right. 
You don't have the right to embarrass and humiliate someone in a public session in personal or social media just because you think they deserve it. We got people today just embarrass people like crazy just because they, they think they're superior and stuff. Is that real Christianity in life? You don't have the right to go next door and shoot your neighbor because he says something disparaging about your mama. What you do is go tell your mama and let her shoot him. No, race that off a tape. Race that off a tape. But a lot of people say, well, you said that about my mama. I'm going to go next door and just shoot you. No, you've got you to have self-discipline in your life. You, you don't have a right to tell another human being in a demeaning way or any other way that they are ugly, even if it's true. What right do we have to be so undisciplined as that? That a God's creation that we could humiliate and disparage. No, you don't have the right to do that. Self-discipline and control means being controlled by God. I'm going to close with this portion. Just a couple points here, several points, of the benefits of self-control. What are they? If you have self-control and discipline in your life, it protects your spiritual life. This is what we got through talking about a while ago, that a person without self-control is like a city that has broken down dilapidated walls. Christy, if you'd come on and be getting ready. Listen, it's, it protects you in life. See, this is where a person says, no, 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 that, that, that's punishing me. And anything that's punishing me, no, you got to punish your flesh. You got to punish your thoughts that are against your spirit. You got to punish them. Not only punish them, you got to defeat them, you see. So when you do that, it protects you as a Christian. It protects you in your walk with Jesus Christ. The second thing that self-control can do, and there are many. I'm just going to highlight these few. But the second thing is, it makes you more attractive to God and to others. Now, this reference I'm about to read you labels women, but I believe it applies to us all. 1 Timothy 2, 9 through 10, the Amplified Version. Also, I desire that women should adorn themselves modestly and appropriately and sensibly in seemingly apparel, not with elaborate hair arrangements or gold or pearls or expensive clothing, but by doing good deeds, Deeds in themselves good and for the good and advantage of those contacted by them as benefits women who profess reverential fear for and devotion to God. He's talking about fully. I, he's labeling women here, but that's, that goes for men too. He's saying here, instead of you trying to beautify yourself to be attractive to the world, let God beautify you through your works and your good deeds unto the Lord God Almighty. Then you and your life, you will become attractive to God. How many of you want to be attractive to God? Man, I want God to get up in the morning and, and, and turn to my spiritual social page and say, how's Jeff doing? I want him to be attractive to me because not that I'm working to get into the kingdom of God, I've gotten into the kingdom of God by being saved, but that my relationship is growing deeper and I'm drawing closer to him in life. It makes me attractive to God. I, 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 I'd like to be so attractive to God that my life would, would be that way, that I could be like Enoch, that I was just taking a stroll one day and God said, I gotta have him. I gotta have that man. Shoop. Up he comes. Amen. I'm going to take him. Mm. That Enoch, the Bible says that Enoch had this testimony that he pleased God. That word please tells me he was a man of discipline and self-control. God just took him. <laughs> Whoa, I'm about to preach now. Hallelujah. Glory be unto God. Thirdly, it causes us to reflect the image of and the character of God by having self-control. You, you know the passage of Scripture in Galatians 5, 22 and 23 talking about the fruit of the Spirit. Amplified version again. But the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the work which His presence within accomplishes is love, joy, gladness, peace, patience, and even temper forbearance, kindness, goodness, or benevolence and faithfulness, gentleness, meekness, humility, self-control, 
self-restraint, continence against such things, there is no law that can bring a charge. That's the fruit of the Spirit in life, you see. It so when you're, when you're walking in self-control, you're reflecting the Spirit of God. Look, they tried their best to get Jesus to unhook himself from the cross and come down and show them, man, I got an S on my chest, hallelujah. I am the baddest one in the land. They say, come on down if you're really the son of man. And what did he do? He showed self-restraint. And he showed discipline because he knew that tying himself to that old rugged cross was going to benefit every one of us. He was reflecting the fruit of the Spirit of his Father in his life, which made him attractive to God. And therefore, he didn't have to be attracted to the world and try to live for their pleasure and their approval and come off of that cross. He just needed to stay where he was at because where he was was glorifying God. Amen? Self-control is a gift to take authority over the devil. 2 Timothy 1 and 7. For God will never give you the spirit of fear, but he gives us the, spirit, the Holy Spirit who gives you mighty power, love, and self-control. That sound mind, you translate it back, it means discipline and self-control. God has not given you a spirit of fear, but power, love, and self-control. So what do you do with that? If he hasn't given you the spirit of fear, but he's given you the spirit of power and self-control, take authority over the devil because he has no rule over you. And lastly, it causes us to focus when we have self-discipline. It causes us to focus on the eternal more than the temporal. 1 Peter 4 and 7, since we are approaching the end of all things, be intentional purposeful and self-controlled so that you can be given to prayer. We can't pray sometimes because we're not self-controlled enough. We got to go do this. We got to go be there. We got to be engaged in this and engaged in that. And oftentimes we wind up focusing on the temporal and leaving the eternal by itself. And it's the most thing that you need in your life today. Now, you got to add to your faith virtue. Virtue, add to knowledge to virtue. And to knowledge, add self-control today. If you want to be strong, if you want to do great exploits, and I'll, I'll continue this message on. I, I, maybe next week I'll continue on to hit some of the others. But it's to get our faith strong. Because we are coming up against an enemy right now in our land that if we don't learn how to tear down everything that has exalted itself against the knowledge of God, the supremacy of who he is, this nation will cease to exist as we know it. And that's the truth. That's the truth. I don't recognize it a lot now. By looking across this land and seeing what we've allowed to happen since the 1960s when the enemy came along to steal prayer out of our school and to eventually take away the Ten Commandments from the public square. What was the purpose? To separate us from our God. To separate us from His love. Hallelujah. While your heads are bowed today, Thank you for indulging me. You always do. You're always so kind to do that. But when I come in here, I come in here with a burden on my heart. I don't come in here to give you a 15-minute sermonette to send you home just to make you feel tickled in your ears. But I want to give you what God has given me every week and every time that I stand behind this pulpit, I try to have a fresh word for you. And that fresh word today is self-control, self-discipline. And look, there ain't a person under the sound of my voice, including this pastor on this stage today, that does not have to fight with self-control and discipline day in and day out of our lives. But you may be here today and you would say, Pastor Jeff, I really need special prayer in a way. I feel like that you have hit a nerve in my spiritual walk, Pastor Jeff. 
And I want to draw close to him. I don't want the enemy to gain advantage on me. I don't want to be selling away my birthright for a stinking bowl of pottage. I want to be able to hang on. I don't want to be a marshmallow Christian. I want to be able to sit there in front of that marshmallow and realize it don't have me, but I have it. I don't, want to, I don't want to be weak and fluffy. I want to be someone who can deny myself and know that Jesus, the Bible says in the Hebrew 11th chapter, that any man that comes to God must believe that he is God and that he does what? He's a rewarder. He will reward you. Praise God. Those kids found out that if I would just hold off and just wait, another marshmallow was on the way. Hallelujah. And it was. And I'm telling you in the spirit the same way, God, will reward you with spiritual resources like you've never known. But if you're here today and you would say, Pastor Jeff, I need special prayer in this area of my life to show constraint, restraint in my life. If that's you, just slip up your hand and say, pray for me, Pastor Jeff. Is there one? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for those hands. Thank you. Anyone? Yes, thank you for that hand. Anyone else? Yes. Thank you right now. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Anyone else? I'm telling you, God will give it to you. He says the reason you don't have is we don't ask. We just allow the flesh just to take control. Ask God to put you in a position that you will stand firm, that those walls and gates of the Spirit will go up and the enemy will not be able to cross those borders into your life and torment you and terrify you and put fear in your life because you have built a wall of self-control and your city is not for sale and it cannot be destroyed. If you would, get up and meet me here at the altar today. Come on.